Well, hey, what's going on, everybody? I'm Sam. I am a student of the Bible, and I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for 22 years, and I'm a writer, um, and I've been trained in Bible theology and biblical languages, and I've been on this journey through the book of Genesis. And so uh, we are at the end of Genesis chapter 3, if you've been following along. If not, go back to the videos. You can catch up. We, um, I have a bunch of videos on the creation of the, of the earth from Genesis 1, 1, and 2. Um, the question of are Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 two different creation accounts? How do we reconcile those two things? Um, and then uh, the end of Genesis 2 about the creation of woman. Was woman created as a servant of the man or were they created more as equal partners? Um, and then uh, yesterday I just did a video on Genesis 3 and the beginning of that where mankind falls um, and makes a decision uh, to sin, to go against God because they're duped by the snake. Um, and so... We are at the end of chapter three, um, and so we've just at the man and his uh, wife, the the Ish and the Isha is what they're called in the Hebrew Bible. Um, they uh, just have taken a bite of the the fruit, and they realize that oh my goodness, we're in trouble here. We've got a problem going on, and so they realize they're naked, um, and they run and they hide. Uh, they thought that this fruit was going to give them wisdom to be able to understand the difference between good and evil and give them knowledge and all this. And what they realized was quickly that it didn't give them just that, but it brought the entire weight of the understanding and, and recognizing of evil on them. And so instead of wisdom and all this kind of stuff, what they felt was fear. They felt shame. They felt, um, uh, I mean, just imagine having a world where everything is just blissful and then, like, all of a sudden, the entirety of evil just downloaded to you. Like, <laughs> the, the, they didn't know what to do with it because they, they, weren't, they weren't meant to handle that. Um, and so now they are trying to, trying to handle all of this. And so they run and they hide because they're naked and they're afraid. So the rest of the text starts out with that being, like, the, the background of it. And um, all of a sudden... God comes down, and, and I think it's what's fascinating in Genesis 2 through 4 is God is very anthropomorphized. He's very, um, has very human characteristics about, uh, about him. So um, he's walking in the garden, um, and it says this, They heard the sound of the Lord God moving about in the garden at the breezy time of day, probably like dusk around that time. Uh, the man and his wife hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? Um, I'm reading from the, uh, the Tanakh. Um, so we can kind of pick up some of the Hebrew, um, kind of nuances here. Um, he replied, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid and God asked them, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree, which I had forbidden you to eat? Now here's, here's something fascinating. I think this is why um, a lot of scholars are going, uh, man, the di the documentary hypothesis really kind of starts to make sense because, um, in Genesis chapter two, three, and four, God is portrayed in a very weird way. He's very anthropomorphized, very human-like characteristics. Um, but it seems like he's just kind of, um, bumbling and stumbling. <laughs> and so like he, he created the man and then realized there was a problem. Um, and then he creates the, uh, all the animals to try to kind of fix the problem, but he can't quite fix it. And he's trying to figure all that out. And then, um, and then he finally figures out, Oh, I need to take from the man to make the Ezer connect though, the, the one suitable helper for the man. Um, and then now he's like surprised that he can't find them. Um, he's surprised that they disobeyed him. And so this idea of this omniscient, omnipotent God is, kind of not in Genesis 2, 3, and 4. Um, he seems way more human than godlike, um, And so there, this causes scholars to question and pause and go, why, why? Why would you have that as the picture of who God is? Now, either, either this is like God being facetious and kind of going, well, I really know what's going on, but I'm going to act like I don't. Or it's really this picture. And I think what makes them lean towards the documentary hypothesis is that um, Genesis chapter one seems like a corrective. It seems like, um, uh, well, we need to go back in and, and establish who God really is. Because if Genesis two, three, and four are the establishment in the Bible of who God is, then this, it feels a little off. 
Um, so we have to go back in and say, no, 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 hold on. God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. He creates at his word. He's spirit hovering over the deep waters. Like that's who God is. Not this stumbling, bumbling thing that's in two, three, and four. Um, so that's a fascinating take. Um, I, I can't say one way or another on what's really going on here, but it does seem that way when you get to Genesis 2, 3, and 4. Like, wow, this seemed like it caught God, caught God off guard. Like, um, how does he not know where they are? How, why does he not know that they ate from the tree? Why is he being so reactionary instead of all-knowing kind of a deal? So, But let's just kind of dive into the story. I think it makes for a better storytelling, um, but let's let's dive in. He says, so well, who told you you were naked, right? Like, uh, did you eat from that tree? The man said, the woman that you put at my side, she gave me of the tree and I ate. Now we learned in our last video that um, the man and the woman, that each and each are sitting like right next to each other at the tree. The serpent is deceiving both of them. He was standing there and he did nothing. So at, the man is complicit in this whole thing. Like there's no way he's going to point the blame at the woman, but he does. He says, the woman that you gave me, you put at my side, that was her fault. And so God kind of plays along. And he says to the woman, he says, uh, what is this that you have done? And the woman replied, well, the serpent duped me and I ate. The serpent uh, tricked me. The serpent was too cunning, too crafty, too wise for me and tricked me. And now I ate it. And now I have this problem. So then the God said, then God said to the serpent after this, because you did this, Here's it. And then they have these three um, levels of curses. The curse on the serpent, curse on the woman, and curse on the man. And so the question that we want to dive into with these curses is, okay, so what's going on with these? Especially, like, when you look at the curse for um, the snake, like, why that is that the curse? We're going to get into it. It's going to be fascinating. Okay, so here's the curse. The curse is, because you did this, more cursed shall you be than all cattle and all the wild beasts. On your belly shall you crawl, and dirt shall you eat all the days of your life. Then he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. They shall strike at your head, and you shall strike at their heel. Okay, so that's the curse for the serpent. And so the question pops up, oh, oh how's that a curse for a serpent, like crawling on its belly? Like, isn't that what the serpents do? Like, how, why are you cursing them for what they already do? Um, eating the dust and, like, all this kind of stuff. Well, here's the deal. We uh, we have to understand the nuance of what's going on at the beginning of this whole section to understand why this is the curse. Okay, so there's some wordplay going on here, especially in the Hebrew Bible. Now, in the NIV Bible that I like to read from in English, um, the, the wordplay is kind of there. It, it tries to be there. Um, it's more of an alliteration in the NIV, but in the... Um, in the Hebrew Bible, it's like full on wordplay. Okay. So the alliteration is this in Genesis chapter three, verse one, we are introduced to the serpent and it says, now the serpent was more crafty or more cunning than all the others. So more crafty, more cunning, pay attention to that. And then in uh, chapter three, verse 14, when the curse happens, it says, um, because you've done this more cursed are you above all livestock and wild animals. So the serpent moves from um, more crafty among all the livestock and wild animals to more cursed. Okay, so I kind of get that. There's like this little alliteration thing going on in, um, in the NIV Bible. They're really trying to kind of connect to the literature and the literary devices that are being used. But in the Hebrew Bible, it's even better. Because in chapter 3, verse 1, when we're introduced to the snake, and it says that the serpent was more shrewd or more cunning, um, the word there in uh, Hebrew is the word arum, okay? And I'm going to put, I think, up here somewhere what that word looks like. Arum, okay? That means more cunning. Um, but in 3.14, when it says that you are more cursed, it's the word um, arur, okay? Arum, more cunning. Arur, more cursed, so it's this wordplay in Hebrew, like anyone who is a Hebrew student or would under, understand the reading and, and listening of Hebrew would be like, oh, that, look at that. That was genius. It was a genius way to do it. Okay, so um, arum, more cunning, arur, more cursed. And so what this is kind of showing us is that the curse is that um, the snake was like at the top of the food chain when it came to wisdom and cunning and craftiness. But the curse is now that the snake has been moved to the bottom. 
that you're the most cursed. And now you will live, you know, go on your belly. You'll eat the dirt. You will you are going to be the lowest of the low. You were the highest of the top. Now you're the lowest of the low. And that's the curse. We're going from Arum to Arur. Uh, and then it says, in between you and the woman, I'm going to put enmity, uh, meaning uh, animosity, hostility, hatred, conflict is going to always be between the serpent and the human. Um, and, you know, we kind of see that today, like unless you're, a rare breed of people who love snakes. We usually kind of run away from snakes. We're like, no, 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 don't want that. Um, and he says the only uh, ability a snake will have to defend itself is to strike at the heel of humans, but humans will have the ability to step on the snake's head. Now, in, in our Christian kind of way of reading this and renegotiating what this text would mean, um, like I said uh, in the video yesterday, uh, Christians in the first century um, CE, and then even uh, some Jewish people in the first century BCE would have started looking back and seeing, oh, that the, the devil or Satan is represented through this serpent. And they started reading that in that way. And so then Christians were like, well, when Jesus came, yeah, Satan kind of got his way with crucifying Jesus and killing him. But ultimately Jesus won, stepped on the head of the snake um, by his victory over death and over sin and over Satan and over evil and all that kind of stuff. And we kind of read that back into the text and renegotiate Genesis chapter three. The first readers of Genesis chapter three would have been like, nah, this is what snakes and humans do now. <laughs> they strike at our heel. We stomp on their heads. Like that's just the curse of, to the snake. Um, the only way the snake has to defend itself is to bite us and we can kill it very easily by stomping on its head. Um, so that's the curse to the serpent. Okay, move from Arum to Arur, stomp on their heads. Uh, now, going to the woman, the curse on the woman. It says to the woman, he said, I'll make you most, I will make most severe your pangs in childbearing. In pain, you shall bear children. Um, so it likely was the fact that maybe there wouldn't have been pain or that much pain in childbearing, or maybe a little bit. Um, but we wouldn't know what it was like before because it isn't recorded before. Um, it's just recorded here. And then, you know, they have children later. Um, and this, you know, scholars would say that this is probably trying to like uh, prescribe or describe something. Um, this curse describes why women have so much pain in childbearing. And it's like, well, it's because you ate the fruit and you, you sin this way. Um, but this is what this curse talks about. And then the second part of it is fascinating. It says, yet your urge shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that people have interpreted this over time. Um, here's my take on it. It's that um, when we first found woman created, she was created as this, the, the, uh, the rescuing helper that is there, but also the connecto, the, the equal in compatibility. And there was this equality thing that was going on between Ish and Ishad. One, you know, togetherness, oneness, the completion of the image of God. But sin screws up stuff and sin messes up relationships really bad. And so um, there's this fighting now for control and for power and who's dominating who and who's ruling who. And so the the woman's going to want to be the dominant one, but the man is given the position of ruler over her now. And, and so instead of being side by side equals, they're now going to be in this hierarchy system and ruling over one another and mad at it and you know, angry about it kind of a deal. And it just is a messed up relational world now where it could have been equal. And uh, when we get to um, Jesus and the cross, when he takes care of this sin issue, the sin problem, what we see Paul writing about in, Genesis, in uh, Galatians 3 is that because of Christ, we can reset that relational boundaries between people. So no longer male nor female, we're all one in Christ. And that's the way it should have been. That's the way it was always meant to be. We weren't meant to be in this like domineering, who's going to be ruling who relationship thing. We were always meant to be in compatibility and equality together. So in Christ, we can be that. So maybe through Christ, we can reset some of what Eden was trying to be about in those relational worlds. But because of sin, we are in this dominate each other kind of a thing. And it's a part of the curse. Uh, then to Adam, to the man, he said, because you did as your wife said and ate of the tree about which I commanded you, wink, wink, you were there, you were complicit, dude. Um, you sh uh, Cursed shall be the ground because of you. By toil shall you eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall it sprout for you. 
but your food shall be the grasses of the field. By the sweat of your brow shall you uh, get bread to eat until you return to the ground, for from it you are taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. The basis of this curse is you are cursed from Eden. You no longer can be in this garden. You're out. And you have to return to the dust. You have to return to this. Remember what we said in one of the videos, like the, the earth um, in Genesis chapter 2 is there's this giant dust ball and God plants a garden and he puts the, the ish in the garden to work it. And then he has the woman there and they are uh, God's representative rulers in the garden. Well, this, is, this curse then is saying you are now forbidden from being in the garden. You have to go back to the dust ball and you have to try to make that um, give you food to sustain you. Um, you have to actually work and till the ground and you have to try to make plants grow to be able to eat from it. You, you're no longer able to cultivate in the garden anymore that was easy to get fruit from the trees and all that kind of stuff. And so basically this part of the curse for the man is you are now no longer allowed to be in Eden. You have your curse to go back to the dust and you're going to die. And this is the, you shall surely die part because without access to the garden, without access to Eden, you have no access to the tree of life, which means you are going to die. And so this is why I say God didn't lie when he was like, he didn't catch him off guard. And he didn't go, uh, you're going to surely die. Oh, just kidding. You're not like he knew he was going to have to banish them from the garden. And in doing so, they're going to return to the dust and the dirt and this dusty dirt bowl and try to make it work for them. And it's going to be hard now to do that. And ultimately you will die away from the tree of life. And so that's exactly what we find there. And so the curse for Adam is mankind is going to die now. Um, and they're going to go out from the garden and they've got to work um, to make it all. It's not no longer easy. Um, so those are the curses uh, to the to serpent, to the woman and to the man. Um, and then there's some fascinating things that happen right away. Um, it says the man named his wife Eve, which um, some have said means mother. Some have said means living um, because she becomes the mother of all the living. So we're, uh, it's, I don't think it's quite clear uh, what that means um, or maybe mother of all living things. Um, but what is absolutely clear here is that God says to the woman, he's going to rule over you. And this is the very first picture we get of man now ruling over his wife. They were created to be these representative rulers together. Um, and when, when, um, the man was naming all of the animals, he was showing his uh, superiority over them and dominating them. But you notice he never named his wife because they were equals. Well, now because of this, because of the curse, he is now naming his wife and showing rule and reign over her. And, um, it's a part of, it's a part of the fall. It's a part of the curse. And, and it's very explicit in the Hebrew text here that that's why he names her is because he is now ruling over her and she is now subservient to him and which she doesn't love and doesn't like. And I don't think any female teller would like that when they were created to be compatible equals. Okay. Um, and it says, then the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So now we have the name Adam and now the name Eve. Um, and Lord God said this, now that man has become like one of us, knowing good and bad, what if he should stretch out his hand and take from also from the tree of life and eat and live forever? So they, banished him from the garden. Um, and they have this cherubim with fiery swords and all kinds of stuff guarding the, the garden. And we are done with the Garden of Eden story. And now they are now out in the dust ball, working, trying to eat from the things that they're producing. The animals are now out with them. Um, there's now the ability to die. And now they are going to produce children and start living this life existence that we have now. So that's the end of Genesis chapter three. And, um, it's a very, it's a very sad thing. Um, if you read through it because you're like, wow, these curses are, um, you know, what, what could have been if we wouldn't have done that? But, uh, here's the deal. It's, it's the, the, um, the lot of every human being that we all come to, right? We all look at this and go, man, every one of us has this sin problem. And this is the Pandora's box that we can use to explain how that all happened. And why things are kind of set up the way they are. And it actually sets up chapter 4 when some tragedy begins to strike over and over and over again. And then we're going to get to see chapter 5, which seems like a boom reset <laughs> of Genesis, of the whole thing. So we'll get there in the next video. Well, thanks for hanging out with me today uh, through Genesis chapter 3. Uh, if you like the content, give me a like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.